Welcome to another message from the Bridge End Gospel Hall. I would like to think with you this time on the subject of a scapegoat. And scapegoat is a word that is used quite often in the world around us, and it's probably a word that most of us have got a good understanding of what is meant by uh, somebody being referred to as a scapegoat. The dictionary defines it as a person who is blamed for the wrongdoings, mistakes or faults of others. And it's, it's very common for us to encounter the use of this phrase that something or someone is a scapegoat for other people's feelings or faults. But it's interesting to notice that the, the word scapegoat is actually a biblical word and it comes from the Bible in the first place. And the very first time that we meet this word is in the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament of the Bible. Leviticus chapter 16 and verse number 8 is the first occurrence of this word scapegoat. It says there, Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And so the scapegoat was a literal goat that was um, to be used in this uh, ceremony that was explained here in Leviticus chapter 16. And further down in Leviticus chapter 16, it gives further instruction as to what the high priest, who was Aaron at this point, but what the high priest was to do with this scapegoat. It says there in verse 21 of chapter 16, Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat. And he shall send them away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. So this was the instruction of what was to be done with this scapegoat. And the people in that day, in Leviticus's day, the people in that day were the same as you or me today that the people then could not live up to the standards that God demanded of them, and neither can we. And when we fail to meet God's standards in our life, that is called sin. Every single individual time that we fail to meet God's standards, that is a sin in the eyes of God. And sin is something that God must deal with. God can't ignore sin. And this was how in the Old Testament, before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, this was how sin was to be dealt with. And the way that it was to be dealt with was that it was to be transferred. Symbolically speaking, it was to be transferred to the head of this goat, and then the goat was to be led outside of the camp to die. And so that scapegoat was punished for what others had done. And that's the very concept of the idea of a scapegoat, a person who is blamed for the wrongdoings, mistakes or faults of others. And that is the origin of the term, comes from the Bible here in Leviticus, as we've been reading, and it is that exact scenario. This goat died for the sins of the people of uh, the camp of the children of Israel. And of course, the instructions around the, the scapegoat, these instructions are symbolic of what the Lord Jesus Christ has now done. The Lord Jesus Christ has done for us what the scapegoat used to do in symbol form for the people in the days when Leviticus was written. It tells us in Isaiah 53 and verse 5, it tells us, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement, which means the punishment, the punishment of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. And that whole idea of the scapegoat suffering and dying uh, and a, as consequence for the wrongs of the people is seen in its perfection in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. That's what happened on the cross where the Lord Jesus Christ died. He provided himself a perfect sacrifice. He never ever failed to meet any of God's standards. He met all of God's standards and he lived a perfect and a sinless life. And he offered himself as a perfect sacrifice on the cross 
at Calvary. And while he was on the cross, the Bible tells us that sin was laid upon him. That's what happened to the scape scapegoat, that sin was laid upon its head. The sins of the people were confessed while the, the high priest was laying his hands upon the head of the scapegoat. And it was symbolic of those sins being transferred to that goat that would die in their place. The Lord Jesus Christ died in our place on the cross at Calvary. And he was made sin for us. That was the significance of his death. That's what it tells us in 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5, verse 21 of 2 Corinthians says, He made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He made him, God made his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin. The sinless son of God was made sin for us. Why did God do that to his only son? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That he has borne the wrath of God in order that we don't have to. And his sacrifice um, is seen in picture form in the experience of that scapegoat. But it tells us in Leviticus 16 and verse 34 that they were to make an atonement for their sins once a year. They were to repeat that um, ceremony with the scapegoat once every year. And that taking away of the sins of the people was not a permanent solution. But the Bible tells us that what the Lord Jesus Christ did, that is a permanent solution. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 12, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. The Lord Jesus Christ offered a single sacrifice for sin. That's what he did in Calvary. He died for our sin in Calvary. And that was enough to satisfy God for the judgment of sin for all of eternity. What's the evidence that what the Lord Jesus Christ was enough? Where's the evidence? Where's the proof that he was successful? The proof is that he rose again the third day. He's alive. He rose again from the dead. He ascended back up into heaven. And the Bible teaches that he is able to save to the uttermost all that come to him for salvation. All you must do is to put your trust in him, is to believe in him, and you will be saved. He will become your scapegoat. He will become the one that willingly accepts the blame for the wrongs that you have done, the wrongs that you have done in the sight of God, the sins that you have committed by not living to the standards that God demands of each of our lives. He has been made sin for us, but he's done it in order that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We might be made. There's a doubt there. The doubt is because you have to take an action. You have to accept him as your saviour. Today, if you are not yet saved, what you have to do is to put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that he is your scapegoat. Believe that he has paid the price for sins that he never committed. And because he has done that, because he has died and rose again from the dead, you can be forgiven and you can be made righteous through him. May you put your trust in him today and may you accept him as your saviour. Thank you very much for your attention.